Why is it that even though you set the same New Year's resolution every year of finally getting into shape, you still don't have the body you actually desire? This is not some video where I'm gonna talk about the five tips how to get a six pack or the best biceps exercises on the road or anything like that. I'm creating here a full guide to really get the body you truly want and actually need. I'm gonna talk a lot about the misconceptions about you know needing a six pack to get hot girls and so on. But really I want you to change your mindset around fitness. I want you to adapt certain habits and throw out other ones. I want you to think about your environment. So this is not just some short video, the best routine to, to have a six pack within two weeks. This is a full in-depth guide. By the end of this video, you're gonna be proud of your body. You're gonna understand what it takes to win. You're gonna get to a level if you apply what I teach here that makes you want to work out that makes you want to be in the right environments that makes you not just have some motivation because that's what most fitness content does right it gives you motivation and that's good but it will give you discipline it will give you long-term vision that you need to get fit and to get as fit as you need for dating and to actually love yourself and your body. I speak from personal experience here. I've been struggling to actually build a, you know, beautiful physique or whatever you call it over like 10 years now. Parts of it is of course, I've been on the road a lot. I've been working in different countries. I rarely stay in one place for a long time, but even that is an excuse to be honest. And we'll talk about excuses a lot in this video because it is the root of most problems so yeah i'm speaking from experience here but it still didn't stop me from dating hot women so let's start with this topic because you're watching this channel because you're probably interested in becoming more masculine attracting hotter women more women going on more dates having more sex so let's ask a question do you need to have a fitness magazine body to date hot women and if i put it like that the obvious answer is no. The crazy part is you don't even need to be that in shape to attract beautiful women. We can overlay some guys here on the video where we see, holy shit, this guy looks horrible and he's still dating this supermodel. What's going on here? Okay, I'm showing some like guys who are in crazy power positions. They're very wealthy or you might instantly judge them as, oh, they're just using money to get girls or, oh, all these women around them are gold diggers. I don't want gold diggers. Maybe there's truth to that, right? But through my experience, basically being obsessed with dating and relationships and attraction and what women really want over the last 10 years, I've learned body is a small part of the complete package of what a man is. In the five elements book that I give away for free, you can find it in the description. I put body at about 10 to 12 percent. That means it really helps you if you want to get that last 10 percent, right? Maybe you're struggling to date eights and nines. You're always kind of stuck at sevens, right? It's like on Tinder, you always get the same type of matches. Girls who you're really excited about always flake. You know, you get dates, but you, you don't get what you really want. Sure, transforming your body can get you that extra 10, 15% and makes you level up. But the truth is stuff like charisma, how you charm girls, how you make girls feel, how you can put pressure on girls, how you can handle girls, right? Because all of these girls you've seen in those photos, they probably are also very strong. They have a strong character. They're very confident. They're very desired. You as a man need to be able to handle these women. You also need to be in a certain power position. You need to let these women know if I lose you, of course I will be sad, but I will move on. I have plenty of other options. All these men I show you, they're not just, you know, fat and rich. They also live in abundance. They are charismatic. They are in networks of other beautiful women. That is a much bigger factor in bonding uh, a high value woman to you than just being fit. Because at the end of the day, you need to live with a person. So if you have a really hot girlfriend or you're trying to manifest a really hot girlfriend, that's the visual, right? Okay, that's the, the photo vision that you have. Oh, it's me with my hot body and now I got the model. Reality is you're gonna live with her. You're gonna cook breakfast with her. You're gonna sit in the car with her. You're gonna wait at the airport with her. You gotta deal with her when she's on her period. You gotta deal with her when she's a bit sick and you know, you're waiting at the doctor's office or when your flight is delayed. That's when the reality of a relationship comes in or deal with her when she's jealous or you know has other trouble in her family life and you need to give her support your six-pack won't help you in any of these things it's something that women have responded to for thousands of years 
uh, it's good to like think further what's next sure it will give you attention but to truly make a really hot girl obsessed with you it's just not enough so if the six pack is not that important what is important from my point of view two things first of all is a basic level of cardio and physical strength do basic stuff right like be a man move move things around lift her up like there is something in a girl's brain that is like if my man cannot lift me up he's weak he's not powerful and i've seen that over and over and there's some truth to that so basic strength which doesn't necessarily come from certain exercises you know it's like more like body weight stuff and of course you want to have endurance you want to be strong enough to be good in bed right you want to be flexible and have certain cardio abilities to like plank to hold certain positions to lift her up properly to hold her weight when you are having sex this is number one super important you want to be able to give women really great sexual experiences you want to be the guy where she thinks oh my god this is the best sex i've ever had and also for you to enjoy sex right like it's obviously this beautiful thing or can be this beautiful thing of like having this sexual experiences with a woman or several women whatever you don't want to get into a sexual encounter thinking already oh my god i know that this position i can only do one minute and then i i can only do those two or if she's like this then i have to be like that or oh my muscle i feel a bit da 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 like it stresses you and then this beautiful thing turns into the stressful act that you kind of do to to get it over with so this is a much more important factor that leads to true enjoyment in life. Now, the second thing is to not be skinny fat, right? There's skinny guys, there's like bulky guys, kind of the mix of the two is the worst. It's like this guy with like really skinny arms and legs, but has a belly on top of it. Why, why is it so bad? Yeah, why? Basically, it communicates an archetype about you. It just shows that you don't take care of your muscles and also don't take care of your nutrition. Like some people are skinny, but at least it shows some muscles and they have a flat stomach. Okay, looks like at least he's not eating trash food all the time and he's moving a bit. Or some guys are like rather big, <laughs> but at least they have like the protective archetype around them. The girl can hug them. They're kind of like bear, bear vibes and you know, she knows, okay, he's strong. He can lift stuff. Yes, he has some extra fat cool whatever some women don't care about that but if you're in the middle if you have the belly but not the muscles it shows you just a programmer sitting all day not taking care of your body at all and basically not having any discipline not having any desire to be a strong masculine and not having even the vision of you becoming a strong man that is kind of like worthy of a strong woman because she wants to feel protected she wants to feel like the guy she's with puts effort into his body. So it's the, the worst of worst of two worlds, obviously through media as well, right? You see the loser in movies is usually skinny fat. They're really skinny with a little bit belly. Uh, it's just not a good look. So if you are in that stage now, you should really pay attention to all the stuff I'm saying in this video. So in this guide, I'm gonna show you simple diets to cut out 90% of the modern toxic bullshit you're eating that's making you fat and slow and tired. I'm gonna also talk about simple workouts that build muscles you need to be good in bed. I'll talk about mindsets that will keep you fit in your 40s, 50s and 60s. This is really important. And the best lifestyle habits to not only look good, right? We don't just wanna get a six pack weekly, but I wanna feel good, I wanna feel focused, I wanna feel strong, I wanna have mental clarity. At the end of the day, we're all like productive human beings. I assume if you watch this channel, you wanna build something in life. You don't just wanna become a workout machine and then be tired all day and fatigued. So we're gonna talk about all that. Now, first of all, the mindset of, okay, quickly getting shredded, right? I talked about New Year's resolutions is a bad idea. I gotta get a pump. Yeah, take a moment. This is a marathon, not a sprint. This is a long-term vision. You need to adapt the mindset of you are working out not for you right now or not for you in the summer or for you even next year. You are working out for yourself in 20, 30 years. You should have the goal to be a grandfather who can still play with his grandchildren, right? Who can still run after them and throw a ball and play in the sandbox and kind of pick stuff up for them because you put 
in the work now you planted the seeds now of course we want to get results quick we all do that's a human but the problem i see with guys who have the wrong mindset they push really hard for a short period of time and then they actually do stuff that hurts them in the long term they start taking these insane uh, fat loss pills they are hiring a trainer and telling him okay let's train five times a week and then maybe they have a month of hardcore training but then they get getting so sick of it by the end right like if you do five times a week for six weeks you'll be so happy when this trainer is kind of like over or when this when the workshop is over that you just go into a three month resting period. They suddenly take steroids or other like weird fake chemical testosterone boosters that, you know, pushes them really in the gym, but then makes them crash after. Maybe they consume high levels of caffeine that uh, again is a good like pre-workout and gives you that extra rep or that extra push or you can put on that extra five kilos on the bench press. But at the end of the day, you're gonna come home, you're gonna crash most important thing with fitness is see the long term right most guys give it a little push they are motivated they watch rocky they go on amazon they buy weights they sign up for the gym they hire a trainer even which is a good idea but then they do it for a month or two they take it too hardcore they damage their body actually and then they stop again for a year and then they have zero progress and another 12 months just passed the other very crucial mindset shift you want to make about fitness is you're not doing it for other people you're not doing it to get the girl you're not doing it to impress someone in that sense or to show it to someone you're doing this for yourself it has an endless list of benefits to be active to get in shape it is what we are born and made to do we have to move around we have a body that needs to be active in order to be happy and fulfilled. On top of that, body is the ultimate status symbol. I mean, I said we don't do it for other people, but if we are trying to impress other people, then having a strong body is the best way to do it. You can rent a car or borrow a car from a friend. You can fake being rich for a week, even pay a hot model to go to the club with you you can fake literally everything in this world through especially for social media or websites or you know buying expensive clothes the one thing you cannot rent you cannot inherit you cannot borrow you cannot really fake is a physically strong beautiful aesthetic body everybody who sees it within one second knows this guy put in the work this guy was not only motivated he was disciplined this guy has endurance. This guy respects himself. This guy even works out when he feels like shit because it's easy to go to the gym when you're motivated and you feel great, right? But the real thing is to do it even when you don't feel like it. How to do that, we go into detail later because everybody you see who has a strong body or aesthetic body, you will think, oh yeah, but they had it easy because blah, blah, blah. Or yeah, of course he, because he lives next to the gym. Or yeah, because his father is also da da da. It's bullshit. The reality is the people who get anywhere in life, be it with a body, a fitness, business, they did it even when they didn't feel like it. That's the big differentiator. I want you to adapt the mindset that is incredibly important for you and for your long-term happiness and benefit, especially as I said, in your 40s, 50s, 60s. You will regret being fat or not flexible in your 50s because even though maybe you have have money now to pay a trainer maybe you have money to to enter the perfect fitness boot camp the best one in the world you know what you don't have anymore time nobody will give you back the 20 years that you didn't focus on this it's impossible the only thing you cannot buy is time and a beautiful body <laughs> socrates said it well no man has the right to be an amateur in the matter of physical training it is a shame for a man to grow old without seeing the beauty and strength of which his body is capable why do we want to get fit? To be good in bed, to improve sleep and focus, to improve mood, motivation, improve eye contact, right? If you're full of testosterone, girls will feel it instantly. Other men will respect you more if they know you train. Absolutely. I see a strong guy on the street, I'm like, this guy trains, this guy does it even when he doesn't feel like it. He would probably even be a good coworker, a good uh, associate, a good employee, a good business partner, because even when times are tough he's still putting in the work i can see that on his body immediately because it shows discipline and you realize your excuses aren't real and all these realizations that you will have working out and still pushing through 
you can put into other areas of your life. So let's talk about how to actually get jacked. I'm not gonna tell you the amount of push-ups and sit-ups and bicep curls you have to do to build a strong body. That is a small section of this video, but really what I've seen consistently is the environment, the accountability systems, the routines you have, the people you surround yourself with, which your network is 90% of the thing. Let's start with accountability and, you know, your environment. Are you running for women's rights? Or for the environment? Imagine the following scenario. Imagine you are hyped to go to the gym, you are motivated, you put up Arnold Schwarzenegger in your room, hired a trainer at the gym, you did your research, you ordered some stretching bands of Amazon, and you're ready to go, and you, you did go like three times this week, and you can't wait to go again the next week. But at the same time, you live in a shared house with four bums, right? With four dudes who smoke weed, who drink four energy drinks every day, who sit on a computer working on their never succeeding online businesses. It's all it. This is Elon Musk. There you are every day needing to overcome this big weight that's on your shoulders to like make it out of the apartment, escape from this environment into the healthy life, right? Like you doing, going running, going to the gym, doing a sport or something. You can see how over a long time, your initial motivation will wear off and it will wear off pretty quickly because you are the average of the five people you surround yourself with. You hear this in other podcasts, I'm sure you've heard that before, and every year I learn it's more and more true. I don't accept people anymore in my environment that don't perform at a certain level, be it business, discipline, fitness, keeping in shape, being, you know, a certain level of charismatic, knowing how to handle women, knowing how to you know, operate in a tribe of men. I just don't accept it. They're just gonna be in my life, maybe for a little bit, but then I'm gonna kick them out or just not connect with them anymore. Imagine the other scenario. Imagine you live in a shared house with four guys who are all pushing themselves. They go to bed on time, they track their sleep, they wake up early, they're fasting, they're tracking their calories, they're eating the right nutrition, they have a disciplined workout regime, they they have a certain cut, they know how to work out, they, they know how to stay in shape, they stretch in the morning, they look good, they feel good, they don't consume any drugs, they only drink certain times of the year, right? They don't have any bad habits in that sense or nothing like destructive. Imagine you're, just, you're in the living room, you live with those guys. They sit there working on their laptop, so one is like, you know, messaging somebody on their phone, uh, the other one is reading a book. You walk into the kitchen, they're all there. You open the, the cupboard and you take out a huge bag of chips. You turn around and they all look at you and they're like, give you the look of like, what the fuck bro, what is that? How hard would it be to eat this bag of chips in that moment? Where four guys who are clearly taking their life more serious than you are, who are respecting themselves more than you are, and who are basically like above you in that sense, and who deserve to date hotter women more than you are, they all look at you full of judgment. And they still probably like you, right? I mean, you're in a house, in that house for a reason. They appreciate you for other things. But just imagine that scenario. Just imagine how big the guilt is to just eat this garbage food, to consume this hundreds of calories that then kind of block you from consuming healthy hundreds of calories instead. You will instantly stop that snacking habit, right? Or at least feel really bad about it every time or start putting in more work in other areas. So with these two examples, you quickly see the environment clearly plays a huge part. Peaceful environment, make a decent living. If you live alone, it can be really difficult. If you live alone, obviously you don't live in each of these examples. You need to build accountability somehow. So that means you need to agree with one, two, three, four other guys to show up at the gym at a certain time. And you need to add stakes. You need to raise the stakes. You basically need to add punishment. The punishment in the house example is guilt. The guy's not respecting you. The guy's potentially kicking you out eventually. Because I know I would. I wouldn't want to live with a guy who's constantly consuming chips. Good chips. Swiping on TikTok, staying up till five in the morning. Why would I live with such a guy? It just makes me worse. You can create that in a, in a different way. You can add accountability, punishment, maybe fines, right? If you're 10 minutes late, you need to pay. $50 or whatever it is, you need to find people who are excited by that idea, 
and who don't think that's stupid sometimes people are late that's okay it just again shows they don't have the same level of standard that you're trying to live up to the ultimate bad environment is when people actively judge you because you want to improve yourself right in the example i mentioned the guys are just lazy and not taking their own life serious and it kind of drags you down a level above that or a level kind of below that even worse is when people shame you or you're vain for working out or you just want to get laid you just want to have sex same with money or you're so focused on money uh you do you don't have a personality anymore real really life is about just being friendly and supporting each other says the hippie who never has any funds to ever support anyone if people truly need it they just go to demonstrations and uh think they're changing the world by that i think real change is going to happen if you truly work on yourself and then you have the funds and the abilities and the skills to truly hold people up to your level so if you're in an environment where people criticize you shame you are passive aggressive towards your goals with fitness, business, seduction, approaching girls, right? If people judge you of like, oh, you approach girls, that's weird. Why are you trying to get laid? You know, just, just be yourself and the right woman will come. All that stuff, big warning sign. You need to get out of that. You need to get out of that as soon as possible. It might not feel like that in the moment because you're in your little bubble and it's kind of how everybody lives and it's fine. Trust me, you're in this bubble and as soon as you would escape from that right now, you look back at it in a month and you look back at this bubble from like a macro kind of viewpoint and you realize how toxic it has been and especially what a waste of time it has been. Every month and every year you're spending in an environment like this. It could be your family, it could be your cousins, it could be your friends from uni, it could be just your colleagues from work. Every year you're spending time with toxic people like that who don't have the, the big vision mindset, who don't have the mindset of I want to become top 1% in whatever that means something. You're wasting. Every year in that environment is a wasted year. You don't see it now. You just have to trust me because I've certainly lived in environments a little bit like that and I did make it out of it. And I think when people say escaping the matrix, this is what the real matrix is. The matrix could be the overlords and the illuminati the media controlling us yeah that is some form of matrix but the real matrix exists next to you ah! the bedroom next to you your neighbor your colleague the next desk in your workplace that's the real matrix you should be striving to escape from another big factor that is stopping you from getting into shape is a lot of sitting and I'm definitely guilty of that, right? Most of my work happens sitting down, except when I'm coaching clients on the street, then I'm lucky because I'm getting a lot of steps in at the same time. But really, society changed. A lot of desk jobs happening right now. A lot of things are happening from the laptop. So you have to actively push against that. You should track your steps. You should have some accountability system in that sense. You should have some routines that make you get up. So you can do this in a fun way. Usually habit stacking can be a great hack for that. You find that in the book uh, Atomic Habits, a great book in order to change things over long term, which goes in line with the theme of this video. But basically what I do is I get up and I take a walk and on that walk, I respond to my team, my clients, my coaching students. And instead of sitting down or in my bed answering, I'm doing it while walking. You can change certain things when you always, you know, get your groceries at a certain place, take a walk there and then maybe take a taxi home or take the metro home if it's far. Instead of getting a coffee at the place that is one block from your home, try out a new cafe every few days and walk for several blocks to get that coffee. Or instead of listening to a podcast, laying down or sitting, do it while walking. Or instead of watching TV, sitting on a couch, you can swap and listen to podcasts instead, which is audio and usually more informative anyway. And you can again do that while walking. So baseline should be around five to seven kilometers a day. It's just a good routine. It's gonna burn a couple hundred calories that enables you to eat a little more, to not feel hungry, right? Allows you a little bit of snacking as well. Because I'm, you know, I like snacking myself, but I also know I can afford to eat a cookie uh, here and there because I'm doing those extra things to burn those extra calories. Most modern men sit in cars to sit in offices so they can come home exhausted and sit on the couch. So 
think about how much you're actually active in a week. Because it's easy to say, oh, I work out four times a week and therefore I should have the dream body. Four hours a week, that's just like, how many percent is that? Let's quickly calculate. That's just 2.3, 2.4% of your entire week is like working out. That's almost nothing. So don't be surprised if you think you're putting the work in at the gym, but you're still staying fat. You're just not moving enough. 97% of your time, you're still kind of stagnant, kind of non-active. So it logically makes sense why there's no real progress. So start moving more, start doing gardening, start walking to shops, start having a routine that includes walking, start taking the stairs, right? Please exit and take the stairs. <laughs> and your blood will flow more, your body will use calories better, you will have more oxygen, you will breathe better and you will sleep better and you will naturally produce more testosterone. Very simple. You can start implementing a lot of that today. Another hack or another reason, so to say, why you don't have the progress you desire is because you don't have a trainer. Just with so many things in life, having a mentor, having somebody who's experienced massively increases your progress. It's kind of like the shortcut to, you know, skipping the early lessons, you're basically buying the mistakes that somebody made and you're not gonna do them yourself. I resisted that for a long time, right? I was like, I don't need a trainer. I already have the gym membership. I have YouTube tutorials. I have a training program that I downloaded. What do I need a trainer for? He's just gonna tell me to do the same thing that's already in my PDF. Trust me, it makes a huge difference. First of all, I have experience now having a personal trainer for over a year. Before, when I lived in Ukraine, he would come to my house, which dissolves and removes so much of the friction of even going to gym, leaving the house. Oh, it's cold, it's raining. He shows up to the house. Cool, even if I'm in my bed, even if I'm like a 10 out of 10 lazy and I'm in my bed, half asleep, I don't wanna even leave my room. He would ring the doorbell and then what am I gonna do? Like let him let him wait in front of the door? No, of course not. I would open the door and at that point, there's no back. He, There's no going back, we would work out. That's one reason, accountability and consistency. I would always make sure to pay at least 10 sessions ahead of time so I know if I don't show up, I lose the money and he was not the cheapest, which is good because it would actually hurt to miss one session. Second of all, he would look at me and he knows, okay, this guy is this tall, he has this body shape, he has this many kilos, his heart rate works like this because he checked it. He can do this many reps with this many kilos. This is how hard I can push him like me, right? He knew he can push me to this level. And when he can push me until here, but here I was saying, no, I'm done. Trust me, I feel bad. He was like, nah, give me another five. And then again and again, and it worked. Every time he said, you can do two more. I was able to do two more. And he knew exactly because of his expertise in this. So when usually I would work out by myself with my specialist workout programs in the good gym and push myself to a six out of 10, he would owe me, always get me to an eight or nine out of 10. So I would just use my time better. So in a way it's actually even financially smart because instead of needing to you know, work out 10 times for 10 hours to get the same effect, he would get it to me in six hours because it would just push me this extra 30, 40% harder. Another big mindset shift is like, okay, it costs money, it's a bit of a luxury, but ask yourself if you could have a time machine and you could pay $10,000 right now to go back in time and start training back then the way you know now how to train and that would get you a six pack right now, would you pay that money? Most people would say yes, right? It would be worth it to obviously skip the effort and just go back in time and be smarter in the past and have the dream body now. Well, you do have a time machine. We're all living in a time machine because time keeps moving. So you can start investing these $10,000 right now, hire a trainer, you can do it on Zoom. There's really no excuses anymore. You can, I put them up my phone against some, you know, rock or, or weight and I have my AirPods in and he tells me what to do. And even though he's not real here, he can still check my posture really well, or you can send him videos and it does work. It's an incredible hack. So not having a trainer basically shows me that you are not taking this serious. If you're not full of excuses of, oh, but it costs money, or, oh, not for me, or I'm special because again, excuses, I don't want to hear it. 
Next major key of getting fit is of course your diet, the stuff you put in your body. Most modern food, you have to understand, is not really food anymore. Especially over the last decades, food industries became not really a deliverer supplier of nutrients. They became mainly marketing companies. Most stuff you can buy these days that have like ingredient lists, that's food that has been designed in a laboratory by scientists, marketers, expert people that know exactly what they're doing when it comes to selling product. They wanna make a profit. And it's been more competitive than ever before because there's more companies in the game. They need to compete. They need to gain market share. They need to make sure to have good profit margins. They need to use cheap ingredients, but still raise the price somehow. You have to understand that every product you buy these days has been engineered to perfection. If you pick up some chocolate bar, for example, and you bite into it, that whole experience has been planned from the unpacking to how it feels in your hand, to how you how soft or strong it is when you bite into it to the sound it makes when you bite into it to the different flavors you will feel to the levels of crunchiness the balance of softness and hardness in the ingredients all of this there's been hundreds of prototypes and people testing it and focus groups coming in and them giving their opinion it has nothing to do with does this actually help you, feed you, give you the nutrients you need? And it's not just true with chocolate bars, it's true with everything else. Even foods that like seem healthy, right? That are marketed as healthy, like high in protein or zero fat or zero sugar or the active line or the bio line or the non GMO line. It's all just marketing terms. None of this is true or none of this is designed to help you. Every product is there to make somebody rich. And how do you get rich? By providing something to people that gets them hooked, that gets them addicted, that makes them feel good in the sense of feeling full of sugar, full of fat, making an explosion in your taste buds. Let's put up some labels of foods here on the screen that you know have a good reputation sort of in the healthy food section. Let's look at oatmeal. Let's look at this label here. Why does all of this stuff need to be in there, right? If oat milk really is just a product from nature where you take oats and mix them with water and then you get this tasty milk out of it, why is this ingredient list so long and full of numbers? Why does it have so much toxic shit that I cannot even pronounce in that? Same with stuff like mayonnaise, you can look at that, peanut butter fish sticks, frozen pizza, any form of dressing, right? Like often certain restaurants, they sell you the healthy option as the salad. And then put like some salad leaves and tomatoes in a bowl. And then you dump half a liter of dressing in it. Well, this dressing is not only full of calories, so you're not really saving calories or eating less. It's also full of other toxic shit that just covers the healthy stuff, which is the salad apparently with just flavor so you can eat it. Sausages, all that stuff. All of these things might have been good in the past, right? I'm sure mayonnaise, if my mom makes it at home, we know what's in there, fine. Uh, sausages made out of meat and some spices, cool. Uh, any form of dressing, peanut butter. Yes, there is peanut butter with 100% peanuts, but there's also peanut butter that's literally like 60% peanuts. There's fish sticks and chicken nuggets I've heard that chicken nuggets are like 40% chicken. So when you eat a chicken nugget, you're eating 60% of stuff that's not in a name, that's not on a label really, that you don't know what it is. But we know what it is. It's it's cheap and it makes you addicted. What's the point of all of that? Or what's the resolution here? Basically, you should eat stuff that has no ingredient list, that doesn't need to list all the stuff that went into it. You just eat an avocado. The ingredient list of an avocado is avocado. The ingredient list of a steak, if you buy it from the butcher is steak. Of course, it comes from an animal and that animal had a certain nutrition. So this is again where you have to be careful and you don't want to choose uh, good sources, grass-fed beef, etc. Or when it comes to chicken, it's often full of hormones because again, if you look at a chicken, we can put it up here from 100 years ago to a chicken how it looks today. Well, that's not a natural evolutionary progress. Obviously, it's been pumped with hormones uh, to make sure it has as much meat as fast as possible so you can grow it fast, kill it fast, make more profit than usual. Other stuff like tomatoes, right, carrots, milk, all that stuff doesn't require an ingredient list. It just is what it is. So 
Very basic rule here when it comes to diet is eat stuff without ingredient lists. And that same idea goes with how things are made, right? Even the oil you use, it's becoming a bit more known now, but seed oils are not just a thing that is, you know, just pressed out of a seed with a normal process. Like you maybe would make coconut oil or olive oil, right? You can make olive oil, but basically taking olives, putting pressure on them and the oil that comes out, that's olive oil. Look at the process that is required to turn canola into canola oil or like flaxseed into flaxseed oil it's insane there's like insane machines required to do that process there's chemical processes there's being chemicals being added there's coloring being added and removed and insane heat that's needed and so on it would have never been possible to create any of these current modern oils that are sold to you as, you know, a healthy alternative to butter. You could never produce that 100, 200 years ago. You just didn't have the technology that's required. So why would you eat something that wasn't even possible to produce just a few years ago? And especially not in the time when our body, our digestive system was being developed by nature. Again, it's, it's pure chemicals and you want to be very aware of how was the stuff cooked that you're buying. So even if you order chicken and broccoli from a delivery service, right? You think, oh, it's the healthy option. Chicken is chicken, broccoli is broccoli. You're right in theory, but that has often been cooked in something. And that thing often is canola oil, very toxic, unhealthy seed oils that are bad for your body. overweight it's like that's crazy look at a photo of a beach these days so many people are overweight no god please no is it because we're sitting more yeah but people had office jobs in the 70s as well it's not like everybody was walking 10 kilometers back then and now nobody is doing it it clearly is the food it clearly is how our buying habits and the the way marketing influences us in terms of what food we buy and what we put in our body. This has changed the most and this is the reason why people are obese now. Let's talk about fasting. Especially intermittent fasting has been a great tool in my life. I've never really had problem being overweight. My problem is more like gaining weight or gaining the right weight, gaining muscle, you know. I can easily gain weight by eating a lot of cookies and cereal, but that just makes me look a bit chubby. The real benefits for fasting for me were the discipline of just not eating for about 16 hours per day and you know you can drink like black coffee or sparkling water and then 16 hours isn't that hard you have your last meal at let's say 9 p.m and then you're allowed to eat the next day at 1 p.m so you wake up you do some work you do some stretching you walk outside a bit you drink a black coffee you get into the flow you drink sparkling water or any water and suddenly it's 1 p.m. It's not that hard. The hardest kind of days of fasting are the first four to five days adapting from your old routines to the new one, but then it's not a big deal. There is a long list of uh, benefits online. It's pretty well researched by now. And again, it just makes sense, right? Think about how we used to live. Think about how our ancestors walked through life, walked through a week. We didn't have a fridge to open every day. We couldn't just, you know, take snacks. We didn't wake up eating first thing right this whole breakfast is the most important meal it's kind of bullshit like the only time where i truly like want to have breakfast and sure that's my genetics as well like other people they really don't eat dinner but they really need breakfast but truly is when i'm about to do really hard cardio work all day right when i would like help my dad outside digging holes okay i feel like damn I, I should really eat breakfast now even when i do a one hour workout with my trainer initially i thought oh i need to eat before the workout because otherwise i don't have any power it's bullshit your body will figure it out you know when i do a lot of cardio like a long session sure i'll have some spoons of yogurt but the reality is your body adapts it's another excuse fasting has a lot of benefits and you should experiment with it so back to the caveman you should think a bit like a caveman when it comes to your movement routines nutrition because after all again i don't need so much science on that and sure there's a lot of bro science and the stuff i'm teaching here but i'm always coming from a point of what is logical is it logical to constantly put food in your mouth no because 
your body needs to rest as well your digestive system shouldn't work 24 7 365 you want to give it some some breaks and again we used to hunt right so we had a big meal we were hunting and then we were maybe hungry again for two or three days eat some berries eat some carrots or whatever people had before even doing agriculture we would sleep in cold rooms we would wake up with the sun we would go to bed without any screens in our face and just fall asleep naturally we would take naps during the day i guess we wouldn't constantly use our brain and focus to work so hard right like even though life has been really tough 10 20 30,000 years ago people weren't constantly grinding they did a hunt, they worked really hard, they pushed themselves, they were sprinting to, to kill something or to, to build something. But then there were also a lot of chilling, a lot of waiting, a lot of playing, a lot of family time, a lot of singing and dancing around the fire apparently. So you can go deeper into this. If you know more about this topic and you want to correct anything I'm saying here, please comment. I'm very happy to learn about this stuff. It's really interesting. Whenever you do something, another easy trick is would a caveman 10,000 years ago approve of that? Or would he think this is really weird, this is really off, this is really unnatural? Let's look at what I am actually eating, what makes me feel good, what gets me in the current shape I am, and what makes me able to operate, travel, and still have mental clarity mostly throughout the year. With a lot of these things, it's what am I not eating? What am I not doing? Yes, there's so many healthy berries and seeds and this movie and this type of fat really helps you and there's this new diet and this new trick and there's this new product, right? There's always something you should do. Opening a health magazine, you feel like, oh my God, so many things I'm not consuming. I must be so sick. I'm doing so many things wrong. Well, again, this is all marketing. People are trying to sell you something. So really, let's look at the basic things I'm doing which automatically cuts out all the other stuff that I'm not doing. By you having a very slimmed down diet, even fitness routine, even working routine. It's often the beauty of the simplicity that makes you really productive because you're not constantly have to think about the 20 step process to get awake in the morning. The most successful people, their morning routine is get up, drink a coffee, take a dump and then go to work. That's usually what they actually say, right? Versus the wannabe successful YouTubers who wanna make a cinematic video where it's like first I stretch then I uh, reaffirm my goals do some journaling then I call my mom take a 12 kilometer walk then I go to the gym then I do my laundry then I go to the shower then I do my hair then I do my beard then I do my skin routine da -da -da -da. suddenly it's 2 p.m. and you didn't get anything done so what am I eating uh, four basic groups consistent of number one animal organs and meat so meat liver uh, different steaks chicken also sometimes heart, experimenting with different organs. What is not in one of those four groups is vegetables. I don't have anything against vegetables, right? I don't think it's like toxic or anything, but I, I don't know, I don't crazy crave it if I have organs. It gives me enough vitamins and, and minerals if I eat stuff like heart and liver on a regular basis that I don't need vegetables also. Also, it kind of is weird for me that a lot of the vegetable that are being sold to us is so healthy are man-made. Like broccoli isn't really a thing or wasn't really a thing. It's produced. It's some little plant genetically modified to turn into a big plant. So, you know, we can buy it. So that's kind of weird. Fruits, I love fruits, banana, pineapple, mango. Also keep in mind, technically, things like avocado, tomato, cucumber are count as fruits. Stuff like squash, I think as well. And yeah, here and there I have stuff like sweet potato as well, which is probably a vegetable. So fruits are great. Eat them as a whole, right? Fruit juice is unnecessary. You're just like now just drinking sugar, which is another huge factor. If you want to lose weight or if you just want to stay lean, you should not consume liquid calories. The only time I consume liquid calories is in a protein shake when I'm actually trying to gain weight. But other than that, just drink water. Everything else is bullshit. Fruit juices are not healthy. Even smoothies and detox smoothies. I believed in that stuff for a long time. If the stuff is so healthy, just eat it instead. Don't concentrate it down into the sugary, high calorie, high fructose liquid that you ingest into your body. Free, 
Category number three is dairy products. So butter, cheese, milk, yogurt, eggs. I'm consuming a lot of that. I don't have any problems with lactose intolerancy. I eat a lot of eggs. I don't have any problems with cholesterol. You know, I would be critical of the old research and the agendas behind it. I'm feeling good consuming a lot of dairy products. I don't have a problem with it. And fourth category kind of is honey and maybe some other supplements like magnesium, which helps me sleep. So honey is quite the superfood. If you buy real honey, it has a lot of vitamins in it and it's like a good natural source of sugar. So what do I eat? As I said, I barely eat in the mornings. I maybe have a coffee. I have a cookie in the, in the mornings here and there because it makes me feel good. It's a bit of a comfort food. It gets me in the zone of working and I like it and I can, as I said, afford it because I do a lot of walking. So my lunch is basically been the same for two years now. It's a variation of scrambled eggs, avocado, a handful of blueberries, a little bit of cooked liver. Sometimes I replace the liver with salmon. Sometimes I replace the avocado with cream cheese, but that's pretty much it. Sometimes I add tuna instead of other sources of meat, but it's always some eggs, something fruity and something fatty on top of it. It's been the same for many, many months. And the beauty of it again is it's easy to replicate. At a most basic thing, I could buy 10 eggs, I could cook them and I just eat four eggs with salt as a lunch, right? That's still better than me ordering a burger with a lot of bread or something cooked in a lot of seed oils. I can do that anywhere, anytime. Eggs and a can of tuna works. For dinner, I'm mostly having steak. Of course, grass-fed beef is better. I love steak with a lot of fat. It's another misconception that fats makes you fat. I eat a lot of fat, right? I, I eat the yogurt with a lot of fat. I eat the milk, drink the milk with a lot of fat. Cheese is fatty. I eat cashew nuts, which are fatty. Um, I eat the meat with the big fat in the middle and I'm not getting fat from it. So please, I hope you don't believe anymore that fat makes you fat. It's carbs and sugar that makes you fat. That gets formed, transformed into sugar and stored in your body because the body cannot really use it straight away. It only uses it in like long terms of fasting as a like last reserve, but fat is getting used for energy straight away. So I'm not doing like keto diet. I've tried, that's a bit extreme, but definitely high fat uh, diet for me works really well. But as I said, I also eat sometimes a cookie or some sweet potatoes or some rice because yeah, carbs aren't that bad if you limit it. And if I know friends who are really fit and really focused with way more carbs, but then they really make sure to eat uh, no processed carbs and like long chain, not so fastly metabolizing uh, carbs. So back to the dinner, basically steak with something. So there might be just cucumber, tomato, maybe some broccoli that I've cooked up in butter. I'm making sure to cook my steak in butter or olive oil or both. So what was for dinner today? Uh, heart, liver, steak cheese and that's pretty much it throughout the day i might have a bowl of uh, yogurt with some berries cut into it i might have a protein shake if i'm in an active phase of working out and that's it it's simple it's basic i can swap here and there things out it's delicious right it's like i'm eating steak every day i'm eating smoked salmon i'm eating bananas and mangoes so as soon as you get off the junk fruit train which just explodes your taste buds every day you know now you might think oh eating the same thing is every day is so boring don't you get bored i'm like no because i reset my taste buds so the stuff i am eating is juicy it's flavory it's buttery it's fatty it's uh, sweet so it's really enjoyable for me and not only that even if it would be not enjoyable i don't see food as this constant source of pleasure right yes sometimes i love going to a good restaurant something i love eating good ice cream like what a pleasure but i don't need that every day that's a horrible idea and mindset to have that you know you need to be entertained by food three times a day that's kind of an insane new notion that never existed food is here to produce energy inside your body and you use that energy to build and you use that energy to improve yourself and to 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 form structures and businesses and form your body and build muscle it's the thing that drives you it's not this thing that is distracting or that should always give you joy on every meal sometimes as i said i just have four eggs sometimes i just eat cold chicken <laughs> sometimes i just eat a bunch of fruits that are just there because i know what i put in my body will come out as something else beautiful and if i put shit in my body 
it will lead to me getting tired. Sure, sometimes I reward myself with something absolutely crazy, tasty, donut, muffin, ice cream thing, but that's a one in a three, four, five, six months occasion where I just, you know, it's like going to the movies. Do I love going to the cinema once every six months? Yes, what a great experiment. Uh, what a great experience, eating popcorn, watching a cool movie on a big screen. Do I watch three movies a day at home on my couch? Absolutely not, that would be wasting my life. So again, why does this diet work so well for me? First of all, it is simple. I know what to shop. I can be on autopilot and still get the ingredients I need. The ingredients are available in every country. I don't need some crazy Westerner specialized import supermarket to get the stuff. It is very restrictive, so no seed oils, no carbs, or very little carbs, a lot of protein. So I just know I will not get tired. For me personally, one of the biggest changes was cutting out a carb heavy breakfast, especially for me as an Austrian. We eat bread, like a lot of bread in the morning. We might have a bowl of muesli cereal. Uh, we might or eat a croissant with a jam. What else we have? Maybe cake even for breakfast. So I would get up, eat breakfast and straight up want to go back to bed. Basically, my day felt over after breakfast. I never had the feeling of truly being awake. So if you can even resonate a little bit with that, try out fasting, try out only drinking, you know, maybe black coffee if you like coffee or tea, green tea in the morning or sparkling water, water, water with lemon, water with ice. It will make you more alert. It's unbelievable, but not eating will actually make you more awake. And then eating at 2, 3 p.m., it will taste so much better and your body will actually crave real foods. Once you put yourself in a state where you feel truly hungry, not just lazy or bored or little cravings, but truly like, I need to eat. Suddenly your brain will kick in and tell you the exact food it actually needs to operate. It's an amazing mechanism that is yeah, beautiful to observe. So as I said, not too much sugar. My cravings went away more and more. It's hard to binge eat steak, right? You have 250, 350 grams of steak in front of you. You eat it, you're kind of done. You don't really want to eat more. It's impossible to like accidentally eat another one, right? Versus bowl of rice, versus cereal, versus bag of chips. We all know that feeling, it just never ends. It's never enough. Am I saying this is the only diet that works? Of course not, right? I have, as I mentioned, a lot of friends who eat differently. I have vegans who build a strong body. I couldn't do it personally because I would have to eat so much protein. As long as you move, as long as you consume not too much shitty carbs and sugars, and as long as you consume enough protein, you are on the right track. Next up, let's talk about other very common vices like coffee, alcohol, and so on. So on coffee, I drink it almost every day. I like coffee. I like the taste. Uh, I like how it helps me in the morning with my digestion, if you know what I mean, and so on. But I'm also very aware that it is a stimulant. It can get addictive. And if you consume a lot of coffee and then you would go to zero, that you definitely would have withdrawal symptoms and you would miss it. Also with coffee, you easily get into a very bad habit, which is, let's assume it's 6 p.m. You wanna get some more work done, you're already feeling tired. You didn't really move all day, so you don't feel energized. You don't do cold plunge. Uh, you don't exercise a lot, so you just feel tired. And then usually the go-to for you is to consume caffeine, right? You drink a coffee, 6 p.m. Many people don't know that the half-life of caffeine in your body is between six and eight hours. That means if you go to bed at midnight, still 50%, at least 50% of that caffeine is still in your system. Even at six in the morning, when you've almost, you know, are going to wake up, still 25 or more percent of that caffeine that you consumed at 6 p.m. is still in your body, which means you don't allow your body to go into proper deep sleep. You don't allow your body to go into proper rest. You're always energized even through the night. Obviously, what's gonna happen if you don't get proper sleep, you wake up, you're kind of groggy through the day. Instantly in the morning, you're gonna have more coffee to balance that out. What happens after another six to 12 hours, 6 p.m.? Again, you have a caffeine crash. What are you gonna do? You drink more coffee to balance that out. What happens then? You're gonna have it in the system at night again. You're gonna get bad sleep and so on. And the cycle continues and continues and continues. And most people who are heavy coffee consumers are firstly unaware of that. And they're trapped into this habit, this routine, this cycle 
for years. Sure, have your morning coffee, but I recommend having a maximum amount of espresso shots slash milligrams of caffeine you consume every day. And secondly, having a cut off time. For me personally, it is around 2 or 3 p.m. where I don't allow myself to have any more caffeine, coffee and the maximum amount of espresso shots I'm allowed to consume every day is three for me. That's it, that's my rule that uh, works for me. Next up, alcohol. Now, alcohol is obviously very toxic and very bad, and it is also very fun. <laughs> I'm not a guy who's like, I never drink, drinking is bad, you're making a contract with the devil if you consume alcohol, oh, you're so bad for drinking a beer, I'm better than you for not drinking ever, I don't need any alcohol to socialize, da da da. Nah, I like having a drink. And I even like getting drunk sometimes, you know? Not out of control, sloppy, embarrassing, blackout drunk. Come on, if you're over 22, 23, or even over 20, don't get too drunk anymore. But having a drink here and there, getting a little boozy, easing up a little bit, I have nothing against that. The problem with alcohol is just as coffee, it hurts your deep sleep hard, right? I do track my sleep with my Apple Watch. This is not an Apple Watch, but with my Apple Watch usually. And that's a really interesting habit because I see even if I consume one glass of wine in the evening with my steak, right? Reasonable, you have a glass of wine. Uh, my deep sleep usually suffers about 50%. So if I usually get almost two hours, I would get 40 minutes uh, if I drink alcohol. Clearly very bad effect, costs me focus the next day, even just one or two drinks. What I do is I cut it out pretty much 90% of the year. I don't drink any alcohol for that time. I don't have like a beer after work, even though it's tempting. If you love the taste of beer, try 0% alcohol uh, beer. I know it's a meme, it's so bad, da da da, but if you need the taste, right? It's the same as kind of like decaf uh, coffee at 6 p.m. if you really crave it, it can be a hack. But in general, I cut it out 90% of the year and then when I drink it, I'm having fun with it, I'm on parties, I don't care about my deep sleep so much, I'm doing tilted trips, I'm with my friends, I'm staying up till three in the morning anyway, I'm sleeping in the next day anyway, I'm having sex with my girlfriend in the evening, in the day, I'm with girls, I'm having fun, I'm enjoying life. It's good to enjoy life. I mean, what are we doing all this hard work for anyway if we don't have certain periods of enjoyment, fun, party, hedonism? I'm not against that. The main thing is the thing you do every day. Are you consuming one or two or three beers every day? Are you craving alcohol throughout the week? If yes, there's something wrong with you and you have to fix it. Now, I've talked about seed oils before. Again, it is a waste product of industries. I could make a whole video on seed oils, but let's keep it short here. It's been a waste product. It is super cheap. It's been marketed heavily by companies who want to profit of you. It definitely leads to horrible diseases. It is not produced naturally. If you just, let's overlay here how it's produced with chemicals, with insane heat, with insane technology to get that oil out of the plants it's not supposed to go in your body it's hard to process and so it's really bad for you and secondly it's very easy to eat it even though you're not aware of it most takeout food made with seed oils uh, it's in most other products that have a long ingredient list with this stuff you have to actively avoid it you have to be very conscious i'm sure i don't even notice 50% of the seed oil that I'm consuming just by quickly having some snack there, something here, you know, eating out here, ordering delivery there and so on. So this is a thing where you have to become hyper conscious and really make it a, a goal, but it will be super beneficial for you long term. I'm still in the process of cutting it out more and more and more out of my diet, starting to ask in kitchens, how is this, you know, grilled or baked or whatever, uh, what oils are you using and so on and being a little more annoying in that sense but uh, it's worth it for your health so that's my opinion on seed oils awareness is raising rising in 2023 anyway on that topic so we're a bit in a transition there so i urge you to be conscious about what oils you're consuming as well also on oils in general they are packed with calories like one spoon of olive oil is like olive oil calories one spoon you can guess with me 120 calories just one spoon right so you put three spoons of olive oil on your salad right healthy boom, 360 calories if you if your goal is to be calorie low every day to lose weight well 360 calories is a lot so the best alternatives to highly processed seed oils are coconut oil and butter use these olive oil is fine too use these only and you'll be fine 
Now let's finally talk about training. Obviously, in order to build a great body, a good physique, mindset is important, environment is important, nutrition is incredibly important, but at the end of the day, you have to move, you have to train, and you have to progressively overload your muscles. Your muscles grow by you using them, using them hard, ripping them even, and they're ripping apart and they grow together back in the middle, so to say. It's a very <laughs> basic explanation. You can go to more into detail on fitness channels and this way the muscle grows. So at a very basic level, you can split it up in lower body and upper body. You can even do it like that. One workout is your lower body workout. Uh, one workout is your upper body workout. And that's good, right? I'm a big proponent of keeping it simple. There is so much advice out there with how you should eat protein uh, throughout the day, six times, which exercise for which muscle exactly, how many reps exactly, how many kilos exactly, how much progression each week exactly, right? That's all great. And obviously it's good that people make a science out of this, right? But keep in mind that these people are scientists of that particular niche. And it is important for them because they are trying to get a little more gain out of their physique. Mostly the people who are telling you really specific, complex fitness advice, they already have an incredible physique. And for them, it's so much harder to get one pound more muscle than for you as a beginner. So their advice is almost to themselves of, okay, how do, I, how do they have to optimize their fitness diet, workouts, environment, and so on? from a 9.6 out of 10 to a 9.8 out of 10. For you, you just have to go from a 3 out of 10 to a 6 out of 10 and you will have incredible results. Which means basic workout that you're consistent with is a hundred times more important than finding your perfect workout, right? You can literally go on Google now, type in three day split, which will be three different workouts that focus on upper body, lower body, the main muscle groups like arms, back, abs, legs, lats, or whatever it is in English. And also focus a little bit on flexibility by doing certain split squats and stretching routines, and you will be fine. The big mistake I made is thinking, oh, I don't have the right workout routine. So I would download a guide. I would even pay for it, right? $100 for the perfect workout program. I would use it for three weeks consistently. Then I would go on a trip for a week. Then I would go there for a week. Then I would go coaching for a week. So three weeks, nothing. Then I would come back. I would slowly ease back into it for a month. Then I had another trip. Then I come back, bam, bam, bam. Six months pass. I've done the program consistently, but really versus somebody who's like actually consistent. In six months, I maybe had the same progress as somebody for one month. And the rest of the time I was traveling on the road eating shit. And then I was blaming the fitness program for not working when really it was my routine, my habits and me just not putting in the work. Any program works if you follow it long enough, right? As long as you progressively overload your muscles and you can do that without weights even, you could do body weight. I've experienced it's easier with weights. You know, it's just nice to pick up a dumbbell and doing this a couple of times and it's hard already versus trying to you know, move furniture in a way that you have to do the push up in a way that it hurts after 10, 12, or 15 reps. But of course, you can do body weight as well, just easier with weights. And it kind of feels better to like move something up and down and pull and pick it up, right? It's kind of like feels strong and manly to move heavy weights around. But yeah, everything is possible. So the real thing is the consistency here. And big bonus having a trainer, I mentioned it, he will push you to new limits. He will push you to a point where you yourself would never or only one out of 20 times push yourself. So that is a huge bonus, a huge hack in that sense. Also, don't only focus on muscle growth. I was incredibly surprised when I started working with a trainer, how bad my flexibility is, how many muscles there are that I'm not hitting at all with very conventional workout routines, how much stronger I am when I do focus on my whole body and flexibility and certain exercises that are, you know, just about whole body strength and holding a certain position and stretching in interesting ways. It really made my body stronger, made me better in bed, made my back pain go away. Think outside the box, right? I, I know I said, okay, basic exercises are great to begin with, and that's good. I would add on to that with a trainer, 
get a trainer who's not only focused on how you know wide your biceps is but how your body works how your body moves how flexible you are how balanced your body is it's such a great feeling to kind of feel wow i'm actually getting stronger i can go longer on a on a snowboard i can go longer in wakeboarding uh, i can have more endurance he's good at giving me the right cardio as well he's not only focused on the the looks but also on the feels and the long-term flexibility and power that my body has and as i mentioned before of course starting to work out consistently three times a week is great it's gonna make you feel better it's gonna push your testosterone it's gonna make you more awake not less but if besides that your whole lifestyle is sitting down being lazy being on the couch not moving at all you're not gonna see huge progress in your physique you might feel better but you probably won't look much better. You need an active lifestyle. And, you know, active lifestyle is kind of this word that sounds almost annoying, like, I don't wanna be active. <laughs> but you can make it fun. I gave several examples in this video. You can combine walking with another task. Uh, you can listen to podcasts while walking, etc., etc. And it doesn't always have to be steps or, uh, you know, hiking or something you don't enjoy. It can be something fun. What about dancing? What about starting to box, which is a lot of cardio? What about going for a swim here and there? What about, you know, going on hikes, exploring new areas of the, the outside the city? What about picking up tennis, doing walks on the beach, which burns extra calories because of the sand, going snorkeling, going snowboarding, trying out different sports, signing up for a dance class and so on. I want you to have fun. Today I went boxing actually in between this video. Let me know if you noticed. And it went past so fast. You know, it was still starting out. It's a lot of cardio. It's being aware of my movement. I'm so focused on the how my body moves and if I'm doing the right thing and how my arm position is that the hour flew by like nothing, right? And it was way more easy and enjoyable than me lifting weights for an entire hour. As a general rule here, the people who have truly incredible physiques, they found joy in moving, right? They're not getting up every day thinking, oh, if I could just avoid going to the gym, if I could just avoid doing my workout, if I could just stay at home playing computer games or just sitting at my desk both working all day. These are not the people who, have, who are in great shape. It's the guys who love playing soccer with their friends who love to go swimming diving in general being active they love you know walking somewhere instead of always taking the car they naturally choose the stairs versus the elevator they found enjoyment in building a strong capable body they're having fun with it they're exploring new things they're signing up for workshops if you think well that's not me that's maybe true right now but it doesn't mean it can never be you but it is a joy to explore your body and it is a shame to not do it for your whole life so this wouldn't be a full guide if i would not also talk about recovery because if you're gonna move a lot you're gonna feel sore right i feel sore today and it's a great feeling it's kind of almost rewarding to know i did something to my body that made the muscles rip which makes them grow with the right food so recovery section one massages this is obviously a luxury it costs money if you earn a certain amount of money like more than 60 70 80k usd per year you can get regular massages it's great it feels good it's not only gonna help you with recovery and just making your body feel more uh relaxed and flexible it's also teaching you about sensuality right i remember buying my first massages starting to go to thai massage places i became a better seducer through that process because i understood oh my god the way she touches me here the way she massages my neck. You know, I, I remember one massage lady, the way she touched my neck was so incredible. I started doing it on every date and girls like melted into me. So it's an amazing skill. Uh, I did a massage course after that because I was so inspired. So great. And obviously high level athletes are getting massages all the time as well. So it's good for you. If you want to have the cheaper version of that you can buy one of the massage guns uh, you see it in gyms here and there so obviously you want to kind of know a little bit how to use them since it's not like hands that are more flexible but it's one machine that is like pumping against your body seriously what the f are you doing um so be careful with that i would always choose a lower setting don't go in too deep don't like force pain onto your body it's more like to shake it up a bit and I'm sure there's YouTube videos out there that explain how to use it correctly. So massage gun you can buy on Amazon for 80, 90, 100 dollars. Next up is a foam roller. 
One of my favorite tools, I'm basically never leaving my home when I'm going on trips without my foam roller. I've been traveling with it for over two years. Get a good quality one. I can put up a photo of my one. Yeah, it's in my suitcase. It's great for relaxing when I have like lower back pain, neck pain, head pain. I lay on it and within 5, 10, 15 minutes, I can release 80% of that pain. Often I get a better recovery and kind of relaxation than even a professional massage if the massage person doesn't know so much what they do. It's also great for warming up. So I take it to the gym every time I bring my own foam roller because not every gym has them. I use it as a warm up. I warm up all my muscles, takes a couple of minutes. Great. And I use it after the gym as a little bit of a cool down. So foam roller, good one is like 50, 60 bucks. Amazing. Get a good brand. Mine is with me, as I said, for two years, still looks brand new and I've been using it a lot, so I can highly recommend that. And again, if you want to know how to do certain exercises, YouTube is your friend. Biggest important factor for recovery is, of course, sleep, right? Everything I've mentioned, the working out, the diet, the cutting out alcohol, the having clarity, waking up with the sun, all of that does not matter if you're not getting good sleep. Sleep is incredibly important. People are slowly waking up to it, pun intended. I enjoy the habit of tracking my sleep. There's different ways to do it. There's the aura ring, which I don't like because if I wear a ring, then I cannot really work out and you know hold bars or hold weights without them pressing into my finger. There's the whoop band, which is more advanced. And there's the Apple Watch, which I use for certain things anyway. But these days, most of the time, I just charge it over the day and I use it at night and it syncs to an app. For me, it's called Auto Sleep, the app on my phone. And it gives me a basic score of how good my recovery was, how much time I spent in deep sleep, which is an important metric for me, and what is my resting heart rate, basically. Is that 100% accurate? No, but it doesn't really matter. I can see clearly see trends, right? When I have an incredibly stressful time, my sleep will change. When I'm going through emotional stress, I see a change. And when I eat like shit, I see a change. When I drink a lot of alcohol, I see a change. Drink too much caffeine, I see a change. So it's kind of fun to get the bill in the end, if you say, if you see it like that, right? I drink a lot of caffeine and I see it does affect my sleep. And I do feel worse the next day. And it's kind of this combination of assumption of, yeah, probably it's bad for me and the data, the proof of in the app, it tells me, and it's clearly an effect of this. I have to cut it out. There's no excuse. It, it keeps you more accountable. So I'm Austrian. Obviously, I love systems. I love tracking anyway. But as Peter Trugger, I think, said, uh, what gets measured gets managed. Whenever you don't measure something, it's so easy to come up with excuses or avoid it or, you know, brush it off. But if you have data, black and white in front of you that just tells you and screams in your face, this is what's happening when you do that. It's so much easier to really take action and make a change. So start tracking your sleep. Easy. Apple Watch, you don't need a new one. Mine is like five years old. Still does the trick. Highly recommend it. A very upcoming trend in the recovery section is ice baths. Now ice just started experimenting with that. I was recently in Bali. Friend took me to a spa. We did like proper ice bath, like, you know, timing it. How long can we do it? Started um, tingling up my neck and so on. That's great. It made me feel more refreshed than ever. Literally like the whole day I felt like on cocaine. Not that I know how it feels to be on cocaine, but clearly it feels like on cocaine. Is it good for recovery? I don't know. I've also heard Dr. Uberman say right after a workout, you should not do an ice bath because it stops that ripping effect of your muscles and it kind of hinders muscle growth. I'm not a doctor. I'm a rock star. Look it up yourself. But clearly ice baths made me feel amazing. They made me feel awake throughout the day. I didn't crave a coffee as much to wake up because I felt 10 out of 10 awake already. And it's just another discipline thing, right? If the first thing in the morning you jump in ice cold water and you are able to Stay in it, doesn't matter, for two, three, five minutes, just longer than you're comfortable. Everything else you do throughout the day becomes so much easier because you've already done the hard thing. Same with a really hard workout with your trainer, right? If you do a workout, everything else becomes automatically easier. If you raise your bar of discomfort and you can still survive, every other thing that was slightly uncomfortable before will by 
definition be easier in that sense ice baths try it out don't wait don't think it's not for you don't think you will get sick or any other excuse it's very well researched by now that it has a lot of benefits try it out try it out once why not everybody knows hydration is important we should drink enough water but it is more than that often i realize for myself and i think you are not different there that you crave juice or soda, Coca-Cola, milkshake, something sweet, da da da, another coffee. And so many times, if I just drink half a liter of water or sparkling water or anything, 80% of that craving goes away. Very interesting. So often we are just thirsty, right? Like a lot of our food is full of sodium. We drink too much salt or eat too much salt. Uh, obviously, we're always craving something because we're constantly shoving shit in our mouth. Just getting more hydrated can lower that a lot. So experiment next time you have a craving for something sweet, for something liquid, but it should not just be water. Just like first down a liter or at least half a liter of water and then see if you still want that thing after. And finally, in the section of recovery, there is masturbation, jizzing, ejaculating, and no fab. That's a whole video, right? The whole no fab video is in the works. Let me know in the comments if I should produce it early and release it soon. It's again logical. If you constantly release your energy, your masculinity, your testosterone in that sense, your masculine focus and direction into a tissue through quickly jerking off in a weird position, of course you're not gonna feel and be as masculine. You want to keep that energy inside of you. You want to put it in sport. You want to put it in competition. You want to put it in your eyes and focus and direct it into a desirable woman's eyes. If you're coming constantly, that's a problem. If you can't take it anymore and you're so horny and you haven't gist in weeks, sure. Give yourself a nice uh, gist session here and there. Um, you know, lower the lights, lay down get some lube, feel the sensuality. I'm not against jerking off uh, entirely, but I am against it again as a habit every day and with a total lack of female uh, interaction, so to say. Of course, if you have sex and you can come on the female's body, that's wonderful because it's what, you, what you're here to do. But if it's always in a tissue by yourself, sitting up, holding your dick really strongly, it's not gonna help you. A few closing thoughts on this full guide. First of all, let me know if you appreciate this video in the comments, but just to wrap it up, environment is everything. Depending who you spend most of your time with, depending on where you're living, in what apartment, community, brotherhood, this will make or break your habits in the long term. Again, motivation is good, but what really changes you is discipline for example i'm here in a villa with five other guys so the six of us are working every day we are creating content every day we work on our online businesses strategically every day we doing some form of sport every day we're going boxing two to three times a week we're going weight training two to three times a week and we're doing yoga about two times a week literally if i would just drop you in this house right now and you would spend the month with us it would be almost impossible for you to not get more fit, to not lose a bit of weight or to not put on a little bit of muscle and to not take all of this more serious. You would just be pulled up by the group. Also, stop waiting for the perfect sign. I'm hearing guys say shit like, oh, now I'm in a transitional phase and uh, I need to wait for my new job and then I can start with that workout thing. Or, um, yeah, I just moved countries or oh, I'm just going for a breakup or oh, I'm just now focused on other things. It's like, it's bullshit. If you cannot, I love Alex Hermosi saying this, he's using this on sales calls, but he's basically saying, if you can only work out in the perfect conditions, then you will stop as soon as things get hard again, right? But if you can prove to yourself that you can do some form of routine, some form of exercise, some form of activity on a weekly basis, even when your lifestyle is not perfect for it, well, imagine it becomes perfect. It will be even easier. You will be able to work out even more. So start now. There will never be a perfect moment to start. Also, you have to accept you will fall off the horse, right? There will be a couple of weeks or a month where you just totally slack off. You fall back into old habits. I want you to accept this and I want you to then push through anyway again. I don't want you to just, because you fell off once, think, ah, this is not for you or 
you're just a loser, you're just a piece of shit, or you just don't have what it takes. Again, everybody who is successful, who, who got where they wanted, they had also struggles like this. They had phases where it was incredibly hard and they were not the best version of themselves. What differentiates these people from the ones who don't win are there is the fact that they got up and they pushed through again anyway and they found strength in that downfall. On that topic, really, if you can take away one thing from that video, it's monitor your excuses. I'm always in awe almost how good the brain is with coming up with excuses. I arrived in Turkey, I'm, I'm the same. I arrived in Turkey about a week ago, went to the gym and I did an exercise that I don't really enjoy. It just like hits this weird muscle and it's painful and my trainer tells me to do more reps. And while I'm doing the exercise, I'm already like, oh, I should only work out twice a week. I think three or four times is too much because of the, like, I'm instantly telling myself the story why the routine I set out for myself is not good and why I should, you know, take it easy just because in that moment I'm in that pain of that exercise. When I could easily just shift my mindset of, oh, this exercise hurts me. That means it must be really good for me. That means I should do more of it. That means that's the perfect exercise I should be doing. I should be doing the hard stuff, not the easy stuff. The hard stuff makes me grow the most and so on. So that's what I did in that second. I noticed my excuse. I shifted my mindset and I found joy in the pain. Become an expert at monitoring your own story, your own excuses, the things you're telling to yourself, because it will be an ever, never, a never ending story, a never ending monologue that you have with yourself. And you can choose to have a negative monologue with yourself or a positive monologue with yourself. It's in your power and nobody else can monitor slash control your thoughts in that sense and what you're gonna do with them. You can see this with fat people, right? Ask a fat person why they're fat and they always have an incredible reason for it. It's their genetics, it's their mom, it's their workplace, it's their shitty boss, it's uh, their shitty school that gave them bad food or whatever other reason that they never had a chance. Sure, genetics play a role in all of that, right? We all born with a certain genetic code, but if you put certain guys in the army for a year, they're gonna get fit because it's the environment. You cannot escape. So don't trust anybody's excuses and especially don't trust your own. And a very common excuse is that you're already tired. So if you would work out, then you would be even more tired. So how in the world could you work out if you're already stressed, you're already working so much, you're already tired, you barely have enough energy to show up on the work meetings you have and you know, uh, put in those assignments you have. What you also now wanna work out, no, it's impossible, right? So that's the paradox. If you're tired now, it's not because you're already moving enough, it's because you're not moving. Start moving and it will automatically crave the right stuff and it will make you cut off shitty habits like too much caffeine, alcohol uh, on a regular basis, sugary stuff, processed stuff, and so on. If you work out really hard and let's say your calorie like average should be whatever, 2,200 calories, you will simply strictly quickly <laughs> decide, do I want to eat a 400 calorie donut right now? Or do I want to eat 400 calories worth of chicken breast that will feed me, satiate me, build my muscle, right? The decision will become very easy when you see it from that point. You will automatically shift your focus onto stuff that actually helps you. It is a journey. The quote of it's a marathon, not a sprint is more true in that than anything else. But really remember a strong, beautiful physique is the ultimate status symbol. It is better than a car. It's better than money because all that stuff, you can be gifted, you can rent it, you can inherit it, you can borrow it, you can fake it. Even a hot girl in your arm, you can lie to her, you can kind of pay her. She can be a sugar baby or you literally pay her to, to be around you for a couple of days. The body you have to earn, nobody can give it to you. And that's how you ultimately gain a lot of respect from women, from men. It will help you in your dating life, not as much as you think, but it still doesn't hurt, especially if you're a guy who's like, I got a lot of else, a lot of other good things going on. I'm already approaching. I'm already going on dates. I'm already having regular sex, but I want to level up. I want to get hotter girls. 
then this is for you as well. If you want to know more about dating in general, if you want to go really deep into this topic of seduction and manifesting the high value women into your life, I'm open for specific coaching. Uh, you can book my four hour package. More on that in the links below. That's it for now. More full guides coming soon. Let me know if you enjoyed this one. Subscribe and see you in the next one. Thank you.